What's up, superheroes? Superman Adam 100 here. Here is day 17. <sighs> now, let me explain myself. For the past couple of days, I've been piping in a bonus video, bonus video, two videos, two videos, and I never did the bonus video. So I figured instead of me once again promising you guys a video, a bonus video that I'm probably going to forget to do, I figured that I would do what I was going to do for the bonus video in today's vlog. Now, it is very well known that there were a whole bunch of differences between Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy. So we are going to read this list, but there's more to this. Abraham Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. John F. Kennedy was elected to Congress in 1946. Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860. John F. Kennedy was elected president in 1960. The names Lincoln and Kennedy each contain seven letters. L-I-N-C-O-L-N. K-E-N-N. E D Y. Both were particularly concerned with civil rights. Both wives lost their children while living in the White House. Both presidents were shot in the head on a Friday. Lincoln's secretary, Kennedy, warned him not to go to the theater. Kennedy's secretary, Lincoln, warned him not to go to Dallas. They were both assassinated by Southerners. They were both succeeded by Southerners, and both of the people that succeeded them were named Johnson. Lincoln's, succeeder, Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson, was born in 1808. Kennedy's successor, Lyndon Johnson, was born in 1908. Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth, was born in 1839. Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, was born in 1939. Both assassins were known by their three names. Both names are comprised of 15 letters. Booth ran from the theater and was caught in a warehouse. Oswald ran from a warehouse and was caught in a theater. Both John Wilkes Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald were assassinated before their trials. Origin. Not long after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963, the above list of amazing coincidences appeared, and it has been widely and continuously reprinted and circulated ever since. Despite the seemingly impressive surface appears, appearance, several of these entries are either misleading or factually incorrect, and the rest are mere superficial coincidences that fail to touch upon the substantial differences and dissimilarities that underlie them. Let's examine them one at a time. Abraham Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. John F. Kennedy was elected to Congress in 1946. This statement is literally true. Both Lincoln and Kennedy were first elected to Congress 100 years apart. Aside from that minor coincidence, however, their political careers both bore little resemblance to each other. Lincoln was an Illinois state legis legislator who, outside of his election to a single term in the House of Representatives, failed in his every attempt to gain national political office until he was elected president in 1860, including an unsuccessful bid for the Senate in 1854, an unsuccessful bid to become the Republican vice presidential candidate in 1856, and another unsuccessful bid for a Senate seat in 1858. Kennedy, on the other hand, enjoyed an unbroken string of political success at the national level when he entered the political arena after World War II. He was elected to the House of Representatives in 1946, re-elected in 1948, re-elected again in 1950, won a Senate seat in 1952, was re-elected to the Senate in 1958, and was elected president in 1960. Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860. John F. Kennedy was elected president in 1960. It's hardly surprising that two men who, as noted above, 
Both achieved their first political successes at the national level 100 years apart, would also ascend to the presidency 100 years apart. This coincidence is even less surprising when we consider that presidential elections are held only once every four years. Lincoln couldn't possibly have been elected president in 1857, 1858, 1859, 1861, 1862, or 1863, because no presidential elections were held in those years. Likewise, Kennedy couldn't possibly have both have been elected president in, a non, in the non-election years of 1957, 1958, 1951, 19, uh, 1959, 1961, 1962, or 1963. So even though both men were politically active at the national level during eight-year spans when they might have been elected president, circumstances dictated that the only years during those spans when they both could have been elected were exactly 100 years apart. We're supposed to be amazed at minor happenstances, such as the two men's being elected exactly 100 years apart, but we're supposed to think nothing of the numerous non-coincidences. Lincoln was born in 1809, Kennedy was born in 1917. Lincoln died in 1865, Kennedy died in 1963. Lincoln was 56 years old at the time of his death, Kennedy was 46 years old at the time of his death. No striking coincidences are convenient 100 year differences in any of those facts. Even when we consider that, absent all other factors, the two men had a 1 in 12 chance of dying in the same month. We find no coincidence there. Lincoln was killed in April. Kennedy was killed in November. Also unmentioned, here is the fact is the, that Lincoln was re-elected to a second term as president. But Kennedy didn't even make it through his first term. He was killed before the completion of his first term. The names Lincoln and Kennedy each contain seven letters. Surely this is the most trivial of coincidences, especially when one considers that the average length of presidential surnames is 6.64 letters. No mention is made of the fact that the two men's first names contain different numbers of letters, and that Kennedy has a middle name, Fitzgerald, while Lincoln had none. Both were particularly concerned with civil rights. Saying that Lincoln and Kennedy were both particularly concerned with civil rights is like saying that Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt were both particularly consider, concerned with war, or that Herbert Hoover and Ronald Reagan were both particularly concerned with economics. Those weren't subjects, those weren't subjects these men evinced a particular interest in. Those were issues they were forced to deal with due to events currently taking place in the U.S. which were beyond their control. Both wives lost their children while living in the White House. Another statement that, while literally true, encompasses events that were completely different in circumstances and nature. All of Lincoln's children were born before he entered the White House, and the Lincolns actually lost two children, not just one, although one, although only one died during Lincoln's tenure as president. <coughs> Excuse me, I dabbed for that one. Edward Lincoln died of tuberculosis in 1850, just before his fourth birthday. And Lincoln's 11-year-old son, Willie, succumbed to typhoid at the end of their first year in the White House. The Kennedys, on the other hand, were the rare presidential couple still young enough to be bearing children after they entered the White House. And a premature child born to Mrs. Kennedy in 1963 died two days later. Other substantial differences not mentioned. The Lincolns had four children, all boys, only one of whom lived to pass his teens. The Kennedys had three children, two boys and a girl, two of whom survived well into adulthood. Both presidents were shot on the Friday. Another non-surprise, absent all of the factors, the odds were already one in seven that both killings would have occurred on the same day of the week. Don't even think about writing to tell us that we're wrong and the odds are really one in 49. If you think we're wrong, you don't understand the question. Add to that the obvious notions that the best chance the average person has to shoot a president is at a public function and the most public functions and that most public functions are held on weekends, and it becomes even more likely that a president would be killed on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Indeed, an earlier plot by Booth to kidnap Lincoln while the latter was attempting a play at the Campbell Hospital was slated from March 17th, also a Friday. Both were shot in the head. This coincidence is another one which is exceedingly trivial in nature. The only two types of shots which reasonably assure a dead victim are chest shots and head shots. The two assassinations committed by head shots aren't the least bit Coincidental. Let me try that again. Least. 
especially when one considers that since both Lincoln and Kennedy were shot from behind and while seated, so the assassins had no other practical choice of target, and the coincidence here is even less surprising when we note the substantial differences. Lincoln was killed indoors with a small handgun at point-blank range. Kennedy was shot outdoors with a rifle from several hundred feet away. Lincoln's secretary, Kennedy, warned him not to go to Fort Theater. Kennedy's secretary, Lincoln, warned him not to go to Dallas. This is one of the coincidences that isn't a coincidence at all. It's simply wrong. John Kennedy did have a secretary named Evelyn Lincoln, who may or may not have warned him about going to Dallas, while one search is in vain to find a Lincoln secretary named Kennedy. Lincoln's White House secretaries were John a. G. Nicolai, 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 or something like that, and John Hay. The more important point is that since presidents are frequent recipients of assassination threats, they rarely make any public appearances without somebody's warning them of potential danger. Only on the extremely rare occasions when a tragedy actually occurs do we later take a note do we later take note of the warnings. In all other cases, the failed prophecies are quickly forgotten. Lincoln received an unusual number of letters about plots to kidnap or assassinate him, said to have numbered at least eighty, yet none of those plots were enacted. Nor does anyone think to mention other attempts at kidnap or assassination that were not preceded by any record by any recorded warnings to the victims. Lincoln was shot at on. At least one of the, at least one other occasion. Yes, Lincoln was warned not to go to Fort Theater by persons concerned for his safety, just as he had been warned not to visit Richmond a week earlier, and just as he had been warned not to attend his own inauguration in eighteen sixty one. Obviously, only one of the myriad myriad only one of the myriad of warnings he received throughout his four years in office was on the mark. Likewise, Kennedy was warned not to visit San Antonio the day before his trip to Dallas, and undoubtedly before a host of other appearances as well. But only the last one he allegedly received is considered significant, because it coincidentally happened to come true. As Gene Dix, as Gene Dix and another physics psychics have demonstrated, if you make one, if you make enough predictions, one of them is eventually bound to come true. The public remembers only that and forgets about all the others, so predictions. Both were assassinated by Southerners. A, dub a dubious use of the term Southerners, John Wilkes Booth was undeniably a Southern sympathizer, but he was born in Maryland, which, along with Delaware, was the northernmost of the border slaves and remained part of the Union throughout the Civil War. Additionally, Booth spent a good deal of his life in the North and thought of himself as a Northerner who understood the South. Oswald was nominally a, Southern, a Southerner by virtue of his having been born in New Orleans. He spent his youth being shuttered being shuttled between Louisiana, Texas and New York before finally joining the Marines. But Oswald's southernness is of no real import is of no real import because unlike Booth, Oswald was not motivated by a religional affiliation. Both were succeeded by Southerners. Both Lincoln and Kennedy were succeeded by Southerners because both had Southerners as vice president. Another fact hardly surprising considering the historical circumstances of their times. Lincoln was a Northern Republican running for re-election while the country was in the midst of a civil war and needing a Southerner and a Democrat to balance the ticket, hence his choice of Tennessee and Andrew Johnson. Kennedy represented New England and therefore needed a vice presidential candidate who could appeal to the populous Southern and Western regions, hence his choice of Southwestern Texas, Texan Lyndon Johnson. The identification of Andrew Johnson as a Southerner is also a bit problematic here. Although Johnson was born in North Carolina and spent his adult life in Tennessee, both slave states, Johnson was also the only Southern Senator who refused to follow his state when it succeeded, and he remained loyal to the Union. Both successors were named Johnson. Given the high frequency of Johnson, literally son of John, as a surname in both Lincoln's and Kennedy's time, this coincidence should be no real surprise to anyone. Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln, was born in 1808. Lyndon Johnson, who succeeded Kennedy, was born in 1908. Another hundred-year coincidence that is hardly surprising since nearly all American politicians that have attained high office, president or vice president, while in the 50 to 70 age range.
That's just not my TV. You probably won't hear it that much, though. And Andrew Johnson and Lyndon Johnson were obviously contemporaries of Lincoln and Kennedy, respectively. Perhaps it's time to point out that there's nothing coincidental about events merely because they somehow involved the number 100. If we sifted through all the Lincoln slash Kennedy data, we could produce multiple instances of events involving the numbers 17, 49, and 116. But nobody would consider those coincidences because they don't yield nice round numbers that have any significance to us, even though they're all just as coincidental as the number 100. Now, once again, let's all consider all the differences between the two Johnsons, such as the one hailed from North Carolina while the other was from Texas, or that one supported slavery while the other championed civil rights, or that one was never elected president in his own right while the other won the biggest presidential landslide in history, or that one was impeached while the other wasn't, or that one became president at the end of a war while the other became president at the beginning of a war. John Wilkes Booth was born in 1839. Lee Harvey Oswald was born in 1939. Another coincidence that is no coincidence because it's plain wrong. Booth was born in 1838, not 1839. Both assassins were both known by their three names. Another coincidence of dubious veracity, John Wilkes Booth was often, was often billed as J. Wilkes Booth, or simply John Wilkes, primarily to distinguish himself from his father or brother, both named Junius, and his brother Edwin, all three of whom were also actors, and as a prominent actor, his name was already familiar to the general public at the time of Lincoln's assassination. Lee Oswald was generally referred to as Lee, not Lee Harvey, before Kennedy's assassination and was unknown to the general public until his arrest. The common usage of his full name only came about after the assassination because his habitual employment of false names, including several variations of his real name, and his possession of forged identification cards made it difficult for the Dallas police, or Dallas police to initially identify him. Both names are comprised of 15 letters. Coincidence? Neither their first nor last names have the same number of letters. And why should it be significant that both assassins had the same number of letters in their full names when the same wasn't true of Abraham Lincoln and John Fitzgerald Kennedy, or of Andrew Johnson and Lyndon Baines Johnson. Once again, perhaps we should focus on the substance on the substantive substantive differences between the two men. Booth was born into a prominent family and like his father was a well known, popular, gregarious actor. Oswald was born and lived most of his life in near poverty level circumstances, never knew his father, who died two months before Oswald was born, and was an obscure, moody, malcontent, who never had any close friends or a steady job. Oswald was married with two children. Booth had neither wife nor offspring. Oswald enlisted in the Marines, but Booth kept the promise to his mother not to join the, conf the Confederate Army. Booth ran from the theater and was caught in a warehouse. Oswald ran from a warehouse and was caught in a theater. <laughs> Booth ran from the... Oh. Another coincidence that is both inaccurate and superficial. Booth shot Lincoln in a theater of the type where live stage shows are held and fled across state lines before being trapped and killed in a tobacco shed several days later. <laughs> <coughs> Oswald shot Kennedy from, not in, a textbook warehouse. Textbook warehouse then remained in Dallas and was caught and taken alive in a movie theater a little over an hour later. Booth and Oswald were assassinated before their trials, another superficial similarity which puts more significant underlying differences and a potentially dubious word use dubious use of the word assassination. Assassinated. After Booth shot Lincoln, he fled the scene and eventually, with co-conspirator David Herold, crossed the 
Potomac from Maryland into Virginia, eluding capture from a total for a total of eleven days before federal troops finally discovered him to be hiding on a farm belonging to Richard Gary and surrounded the barn in which he and Harold were sleeping. The two men were ordered to surrender. Harold complied, but when Booth failed to drop his weapon and come out, the barn was set ablaze. A trooper named Boston Corbett, who was watching Booth do a gap in the barn sighting, shot the assassin. Whether Corbett can be said to have assassinated Booth is problematic. The deeply religious Corbett sometimes claimed that he had shot Booth because Providence directed him to do it or because he did not want Booth to be roasted alive. But he also testified that he shot Booth because he saw Booth in the act of stooping or springing and concluded he was going to use his weapons. Oswald left the warehouse from which he shot Kennedy and was arrested in a movie theater a little over an hour later by police officers who had no idea who he was. Oswald was initially arrested only for the murder of Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett, whom he shot while in flight. His connection to the Kennedy assassination was not established until later. Oswald was captured alive and remained in custody for two days before being gunned down by Jack Ruby, a private citizen. Other differences, Booth was sh other differences. Booth was shot in the back. Booth was shot in the back of the neck and lived for another three hours. Oswald was shot in the abdomen and died within minutes of his arrival at Parkland Hospital. A month before Lincoln was assassinated, he was in Monroe, Maryland. A month before. A month before Kennedy was assassinated, he was in Marilyn Monroe. This is a latter-day addition to the list and nothing more than a bit of salacious of salacious humor. Even as a humorous coincidence, it fails the test as Marilyn Monroe died well over a year before Kennedy's assassination. So what are we to make of all this? How do we account for all these coincidences, no matter how superficial they may be? And, and why do so many people find this list so compelling? The coincidences are easily explained as a, simply, as a simple product of mere chance. It's not difficult to find patterns and similarities between any two marginally related sets of data. A coincidence is similar in number and can, can be and have been found between many different periods of precedent. Our tendency to seek out patterns wherever we can stem, wherever we can stem from our desire, wherever we can stem from our desire to make sense of our world, to maintain a feeling that our universe is order, is orderly and can be understood. In this specific case, two hours of our most beloved presidents were murdered for reasons that make little or no sense to many of us. The case. In a specific case, two of our most beloved presidents were murdered for reasons that make little or no sense to many of us. And by finding patterns in our deaths, we also find we also hope to find a larger cosmic something that seemingly provides some reassuring, if I defin if indef if indefinite, rhyme or reason why these great men were prematurely snatched from our mortal sphere. Last updated on November 24th, 2016, originally published on June 12th, 1999. Thank you guys for watching. If you'd like to subscribe, please do. I'm sorry if I stumbled over my words a couple times. I'm not really that good at reading. If you'd like to subscribe, please do. If you don't want to, then of course you don't have to. Have a good day. I love you all, and I'll see you tomorrow.